Hi, I'm John Asat. This is is my new friend, J Joe Kelly, and um, we are we are going to. He wanted to know something from me, so ask me. Ask That's me. right, uh, John. I, I I was curious. You know, in in this field and with your exposure on social media, doing your vlog and your writings, um, what are people coming to you with as far as concerns in this field? Authoritarian abuse. Um, cultic involvement? Uh, are they families? Are they individuals? Are they ex-members? Well, uh, pretty much ex-members. Because I moved away from the intervention business 25 years ago, um, it, it just became too much because my focus was Scientology and you know how they harass people. Um, and after I about do. the 10th court case, I, it just became too much. Um, so my contact is, is largely from ex-members. Um, who who are wanting to understand their experience um, in in wider terms? I'm much you know I'm more interested now in educational institutions and getting the word out to as many people as possible because um, as, as we've said before th this isn't a problem about pseudo religious groups or therapy groups or multi level marketing. Um, it's all of those things. It's also about abusive personal relationships. It's also about political groups. And I think we're, we're seeing more and more authoritarian cultic behavior in those groups. I mean, the division in this country over Brexit, it, it's something I've never, you know, I'm 65, but I've never experienced anything like this. I've seen Labour versus Tory, you know, throughout my life. But it's never been as vitriolic as it's become. And in the last 20 years in the US, politics has become, you know, this split. So where it used to be that sure. in the Senate and the House, people would vote based upon conscience and principle, they now vote based upon party. And that is very dangerous because it means that they will vote against the interests of, of the people who elected them. And it's know, fascinating well, to, to, to I, I just wonder what what is the motive of these individuals? What what are they hoping to gain? Ultimately, they've been elected to office and yet they're putting forward a doctrine of uh, of an individual who is soon to be out of office. Uh, he's he's been voted out, even if he doesn't acknowledge it. Even Mitch and, McConnell and, has, has admitted it. Yeah, that's right. And, and so. You know, what is it that's motivating these individuals who are continuing to come forward and say, this is an unfair election? Um, you know, it's, it's a repetition of a propaganda that's been fed to them uh, via social media or uh, alternative news sources, which didn't exist 20 years ago to the extent that they exist now. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the same thing at work in cults that you know, we have social media and we have every variety of involvement of certain groups either defending their position or as ex-members critiquing the position. And mm -hmm. all of that information is available and yet people are still joining groups. Mm -hmm. So authoritarianism is a specter that lives with us mm -hmm. in so many different aspects of our, of our everyday life. And, and I was curious about in your work and in your uh, exposition of this issue, mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as the most daunting part of this? Uh, it seems like a bottomless pit at times. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because in the last few weeks, I've, I've had several conversations, uh, one with a, a guy who's working with ex-members and has for years, um, one with a psychiatrist friend who, who's been trying to deal with parental alienation he's you know long retired um and a couple of other conversations with with people are very involved and in each case their start their hope i talked with chris shelton the other week in each case their hope is starting to wear thin that they're, they're starting to go you know as you said it's a bottomless pit how can we ever do anything about it my perspective is very different and i'm mm -hmm. I hope that at the end of the conversations i had with all of these people um well they all said that that it had shifted their idea a little bit. We have to put what's happening in the context of history. And um, 
the argument that you know we are bound by our genetics that, that human beings are aggressive that we have to behave this way that's pretty much disproven in the contemporary ideas of evolutionary development um mm -hmm. either your blonkers uh, evolution in four dimensions is an excellent work on that we have a an introduction to it by Yuval Laor, who studied with her on the channel. And for me, it gives tremendous hope. You look back to, <clears throat> excuse me, say 150 years ago, where four-year-old children were being put up chimneys to clean them in this country. And if they got stuck, you left them there. Mm. Uh, they would go down mines at the age of four mm. uh, and be used as pit ponies. Um, they would be losing their fingers working in the weaving works. This these attitudes are no longer acceptable. Um, and that was because of political change. That was because of the movement towards more democracy. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of World War I, the suffragette movement, and this is, doesn't seem to be broadly known, <clears throat> they're a terrorist organization. They blew things up. There were deaths involved. Mm -hmm. By the criteria that we use today, they're a terrorist organization. They were working for something very important, rights for women, incredibly important. But they were not the only, they were the suffragists, there were other movements. But the suffragettes actually signed a deal with the government in the UK to say that they would stop their harassive activities and they would go out and hand white feathers to any man who was not in uniform. And in return, they were given the vote. You know, in 1919, women over 30 were given the vote in Britain. Um, so, but at the beginning of that war, men were queuing up to go and kill this enemy, this terrible enemy, the Bosch, the Hun, these awful people. When the second invasion of Iraq happened, a million people went onto the streets in this country with placards reading, not in my name. And mm -hmm. that shift in society, mm. even though it, it's fair to say there was the America First movement in the US before the Second World War, which did a similar thing, but was not as big. There was as bigger, you know, the brown shirts, the silver shirts, the yep. fascist groups uh, in the US were pretty sizable too. I think there is a, there is a move in compassion um, that, that we are gradually caring more about other human beings. I think part of that is that a third of the people in the world now have plenty, you know, so uh, we're breeding less because that seems to go along with having enough to eat and somewhere comfortable to live. But we have more time and more concern about other people. And if we can then take the, the simplest ideas, which our children are not being taught. So Ira Chalef's intelligent disobedience is always my my first place i you know i'll admit an interest i've known ira for more than 40 years we're good friends um but his work on courageous followership and intelligent disobedience saying why would you want to bring children up to do as they're told you want to bring them up to the point where they become adults and are able to make up their own minds about the best thing to do um, but, but isn't it the case that in in societies where it's important to continue a certain way of living standard of living, that to have your children follow suit, it becomes essential as opposed to having them have their own ideas independent of your own. <laughs> well, I, th I, mean, I think it, I think the point is that if the society is going to develop creatively, right, we're coming to a point now, I mean, in the 1970s, it seemed to me that automation in factories was ultimately going to take over. You know, when Fiat started using robots in their car factories. And I wondered why nobody was doing anything about that and saying, well, full employment is no longer a goal for humanity. Having everybody in a job is not a goal. The goal is the development of humanity. And so, you know, how can we do things that are good and useful instead? And instead, we've had consumerism. Instead, we've had right. viral mental devastation. So, that old obedience model has continued the world. I think a, a model that allows, you know, where education is not for the people in the middle, the, you know, so that the people who have difficulties in education, you know, they don't get an education and the people who are really smart, the overachievers, as they're sometimes called, they don't get an education either unless they go to a 
very specialized school. You just have this mid group and they're being taught obedience and it gets worse in high school. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who used to be a teacher and just gave up on it uh, the other week. And she said in, in primary school in um, I think it's grade school way, where you are, yep. you, you know, you, you go and get a ruler when you need one, you go and get something when you need it. In secondary school, you have to ask permission, you know, and that this had offended her. And I, I don't, it doesn't surprise me, but I think that, you know, making people collaborative members of a society rather than competing, your know, competition has become, you know, and it is recognized in education now that through competition, you are all, you know, they're always out of 30 people, there's one winner and 29 losers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you're conditioning people to fit in, to be part of a hierarchy, rather than to break out and say, you know, well, I don't want to recycle things. I, I want to stop using so much. I want to, you know, less plastic to be manufactured. I want it to be biodegradable. I, you know, I want people to think about it. There's a wonderful book called Cradle to Cradle, <clears throat> it's about, published about 20 years ago, and it's, it's printed on plastic. And the authors point <laughs> out that printing books on, on paper is stupid because they are things that you keep. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but the publisher, yeah, and you can drop this one in the bath and it's still fine, you know, which, which is useful for people like me who read in the bath. So I think that, 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 there is, I think that there are all sorts of preconceptions that are wrong. We're not actually educating people anymore. The, no. I, my two teenage boys, year in, year out, I was told by teachers, they've got to jump through the hoops. And when my, they were, they were both um, diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which they don't have, and I never thought they did have. Mm -hmm. They have a delayed sleep-wake phase, which I have. In which their two older <laughs> siblings are diagnosed with this. And, well. and this is handed down uh, apparently genetically. It is genetic. The, mm -hmm. There are two markers for it, the uh, periodicity three gene, PER three gene and the CRY one gene, but there are probably many more. It was thought for a long time that the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which by supra means underneath the chiasmatic nucleus, what a great name, that that controlled the body clocks. So your core temperature when you sleep, your breathing rate, your heart rate, these things are fixed. Uh, now we know there are more than a thousand clocks in the body. And so basically if you force somebody out of their normal sleeping time, <clears throat> we see this a lot with nurses that they're forced onto shifts and they will often become obese. They have the highest rate of obesity and sometimes really dangerous obesity. And I'm going, well, that's because your sleep and your digestion is one metabolism. It's one system. If you're forced to sleep the wrong time, you're likely to have health problems. Um, so anyway, my two boys, because of the difficulties they had, they, they couldn't be in school. And we got all of this stuff about them jumping through hoops. And my, my older boy, Sam, who, who does the channel with me, now 18 he did what are called uh, advanced levels here you do three or four of these and that's your senior high school here and he was just you know in fact before doing that doing what are called gcse's which you do at age 16 he got lost you know he only had two terms to do eight terms of work mm. and what he'd been taught at school was confusing so for example in biology every time they got to something difficult they say we'll explain that later just memorize mm. and he couldn't and he then found we found the Khan Academy online and Khan is very good at maths and biology <clears throat> and he explains everything and so my son ended up getting very good grades without going to school and without jumping through any hoops and being educated rather than being expected to just you know spew forth a, a list of um, facts which anybody could look up on Wikipedia anyway. Um, it, it, the book that I'm just about to publish a new edition of, which will be called Opening Our Minds, it's out as Opening Minds at the moment. One of the points I make in it is that Thomas Edison used to have a test that you had to pass if you wanted to work for him, the Edison test, which you can find online. It gives some examples of it in, in the book. Einstein failed the test. What does that tell us? Mm, mm. Einstein, when asked this... Yeah, Einstein, when asked what the speed of light was, said, I, I don't remember. 
I, I look it yeah. up in the book when I need it. Yeah. So, so what you fill your mind with, um, you know, and, and the ability to um, bring that to the fore is something that, you know, some people have talent in and it doesn't necessarily mean they have uh, more intelligence than, than the other. No, and intelligence um, is such a dangerous concept, you know. Um, I think Howard Gardner's work where he says there are five different intelligences. I, I'd, like, I'd rather he used the word aptitude, but certainly my experience in, you know, I've dealt with a lot of artists, musicians, the worlds I've lived in. You can be with a virtuoso musician who is just staggeringly brilliant, but they can't cook dinner. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that it, so it does seem to me that we, there are things that we have an aptitude for and other things we don't. And we live in a society where memorizing facts is held to be important. And of course, as soon as computers came along, you've got it on your mobile phone now. I mean, and, and for me, of course, that, you know, perhaps for you, it's difficult that I, whenever I say something, my kids are sat there checking on their phone, you know, but I, I'm glad they do. I'm, I'm glad that there is that, you know, way of, of fact checking. Um, of course, the internet has given us this thing that in the conversation we just had with Pat, that um, the print media and the news media are now being superseded by people saying what they think about it. And we then get these echo chambers, which is relevant to the political groupings that people will. So there's that wonderful documentary, The Brainwashing of My Dad, where we see a, <clears throat> a very, Fox News. very friendly, yeah, exactly, a very friendly man who is then submitted yeah. to Rush Limbaugh and Fox News, yeah. and becomes yeah. hateful and aggressive. And then his yeah. very sensible wife, because he can't figure how to work the feeds, switches off all those feeds and gives him, you know, um, more fact-based feeds, let's say, and his temperament changes again. He becomes, and he looks back and says, "Yes, I, I, it made me very angry." It's happened all over America. With it has, and 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 I think that explains uh, why the people coming to the fore, coming to to me, looking for aid uh, with their loved ones. It's not always a group that we have a lot of information on. It's it's the uh, syncretistic nature of information on the web that they gather. They then use it. Yeah. For one, two, maybe ten individuals, um, they become, you know, the 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 membership, yeah. uh, and it doesn't yeah. require many, but That's it transforms their life in some way. Um, some people, you know, happen upon the information; it has very little effect, and others become dramatically changed mm -hmm. just by mm -hmm. the very nature of that new information, and yeah. isolate yeah. themselves from the world at large and. Sometimes it even affects their employment. And these are the kinds of cases that we, we've never had before, mm. but we're now seeing uh, increasingly, uh, as, as increasingly common mm. in the uh, people who come to us for assistance. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wrote a, a, a chapter which is uh, with Steve Hassan, which is due to come out in an Oxford University Press book this coming year. And you we were asked. I can't. Even, I, I don't even know what the title is. You know, isn't that terrible? <laughs> yeah. I've been working on this thing for more than a year, um, and I don't know what the book's called. Um, shows you how clever I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we also uh, co-wrote a piece, uh, a book called um, "Antisemitism and Psychiatry" or "Psychiatry and Antisemitism," uh, which was a very interesting thing for me. But in each case, we were looking at the way that the internet can radicalize people the internet who so we looked at the case of elliot roger um who uh, killed people in santa barbara um and uh, dylan roof who went into mm -hmm. a black church and murdered people mm -hmm. killed people um and looking at their cases they were interesting because they didn't have a group leader they were so, people who picked up information in Elliot Rogers case he he was an involuntary celibate an incel and, and so. he generalized out you know from the few women that he'd approached who'd rejected him he decided that the three and a half billion or so women in the world were all evil and he was going to teach them a lesson by killing people and he was an intelligent young man who had found himself going down a rabbit hole 
Uh, Dylan Roof was perhaps not as intelligent, um, but he wrote a, a manifesto called The Last Redition, which is, of course, still on the internet. And it's only about nine pages. And very interesting to see how his mind was distorted by contact with um, right-wing groups, um, white nationalist groups, as they call themselves now. You know, he declares with authority that slaves prefer to be slaves. And you sort of go, yeah, well, I can show you some material that uh, conflicts with that notion that, you know, and he's then going to go and kill people to do this. So the, the Internet has this dangerous edge now that, as you say, if you're going to have a group, if you can get 10 people to give you 10 percent of their income, you've got an income. You so do. you can maintain a small group where people will, you know, and it's pretty easy to find techniques that that will get people to believe in you you know because so inf information in and of itself if delivered to the person affected by these um negative toxic sources of information isn't always enough no. um so because it's all out there the critique and and the information so um sometimes it's difficult for families to sort through what should i do next you know, what will work, what will um, adjust my loved one's thinking or, you know, what can I do to help them because they're out of touch with reality. Yeah. Um, and this becomes a very difficult moment when they realize that the information that, that would normally challenge and affect change is no longer of any use. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what's next? you know, how best can we help them in that case? And that's where um, specialists come in, I think, who have some experience with working with individuals and understanding that, that the psychology of authoritarianism and undue influence can be helpful. Yeah, I, I mean, in the Kazan seminar, one of the, in the Q&A period afterwards, one of the questions, well, two questions were put together. And one of them was, um, you know, how do you respond if somebody you love becomes involved in such a group? And the other was, how do you get them out? And I had to separate the two questions and say, these are to totally different things. Mm -hmm. To, you know, somebody becomes involved, you treat them absolutely kindly and in a friendly way. You don't challenge their beliefs. You don't talk about the group. You don't try and provide them with evidence because as we know, cognitive dissonance shows that it will only make their beliefs stronger. But don't think that you're going to develop the skills to talk them out because, you know, it, as we found, I mean, I, I, I spent, I don't know, uh, 12, 13, 12 or 13, 12 years talking with members, ex-members, you know, much of the time, spending much of my life doing that. And it took me certainly the first seven years to find, you know, how to best do that so from you know conversations that indeed went on for seven years with people i got down to the point where in a day or two i could get you know and sometimes in fact much faster than that i could get somebody to think about it and the point was not really to take them i mean people leaving scientology probably think they're now going to have have to have 10 pay for ten thousand hours of counseling to get them out and for me it's just that one little poke which gets them to be willing to question the doctrine. That's right. And, and that individual's association with the group is specific to, to how they, what they find most fascinating with the group. You yes. know, it, and it varies depending on where you are in the group structure and, and what it is you hope to get out of it, um, what your needs were going in, and uh, how many of those needs have been satisfied by the group structure and by your experience in relating to the group. Sometimes relationships are central. Sometimes yes. ideology is important. Sometimes some combination of all of those. Sometimes it's a way to tamp down negative feelings that if, if uh, and actually those people have improved their lot in life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's how it's often, I mean, there's, I had to talk with Christian Sherko, who's, you know, had 40 years of talking with people and is phenomenal. He's incredible. But he came to me and he said, I, I want to talk about the benefits that can derive from groups. 
why am you know and, and i've always held that point of view that you don't just oh you're in an evil dreadful group you have to go what were the benefits what are the you know the the deficits of, of having been involved um and I, and i think you know it, it's there for a, a continuation of life experience where where one is saying well that was a part of my maturing that was a part of my education that was you know i, I don't resent having spent nine years studying Scientology. I don't think I could have learned what I know without that. You know, no. um, you know, I'm not going to go with the Sufis and start praying for harm to come to me so I'll learn something. The only problem <laughs> I do have is that I probably could have learned it in about three weeks, you know, spending nine years That's doing right. it. That's right. I, I think, you know, for, I think you raise a valid point that the, the ex-member has a unique perspective and sense of what may be going on at, at a various at various points, and and then having talked to so many other ex members who've been kind enough to share their own life experience and uh, give insight into what led them out, uh, mm -hmm. or what made led them to review uh, the process of of leaving, what it looks like, uh, individual to individual and group to group, mm -hmm. uh, I think is important to understand and. Uh, and have some some handle on and beyond that uh, there's an advantage that, that ex-members have as long as you have the humility to accept that you were wrong it's that simple right. the perception was wrong because that then allows you to view you know i i remember talking to a guy who'd, who'd been in the top management of scientology and at the end of yeah we had to have these um secret meetings in diners and he, he was never to be named and all of this kind of thing all the cloak and dagger around this that i lived with was quite fascinating uh, 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 yeah. at the end of our meetings he said the great thing is john will never be conned again and i just looked at him and said no 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 the great thing is that i know i'm very gullible that's right and that was more or less what i learned from margaret singer early on when i was leaving group number one and and uh, still much inv uh, deeply involved in group number two, you know, and that is that don't think that because you've got this bit of understanding that somehow you're going to be free of the need to be always on your guard. Mm -hmm. That um, some people are born with um, uh, an interest in these things. And as a result, they're more open. You, you may be more open to alternative concepts and ways of experiencing reality that others have no interest in. Um, you know, the, the, the straight functioning individual said, I could, I could never be taken in by such obscure and, you know, absurd belief systems. Yet they've, when, when you scrape the surface just a little bit, you find just as much uh, oddity <laughs> in their thinking as you would in the person who obviously is following uh, a guru. Um, yeah. I, I had a, a guy who, who, who wrote saying that he had no beliefs. And I had to ask yeah. him if he really believed that. You know, be, because the point is, it's like with the, a militant atheist who's kind of going, look, I know the truth. And you're going, yeah, I've heard that before. And you say, well, what is the truth? And you say, well, the universe began with a big bang. And you say, why? It's like, I don't know. And you say, and you understand how an 11 dimensional P membrane collapsed into three dimensions. And they say, what are you talking about? You say, well, do you just believe the Big Bang happened? You haven't read Stephen Hawking's mathematical proof? Well, you know, it's a belief. It's handed down, but it's a belief. And then you have the feeling of certainty, the feeling of knowledge, which is such an impediment. To human which life. can be the trap and, and, and also uh, prevent you from being open to, to any sort of external point of view. Yeah. I think one thing that, you know, when I was um, helping to set up the Open Minds Foundation and I moved away from it to basically run this YouTube channel, really, mainly. But when I was setting that up, I really believed that survivors of authoritarian groups, of cult groups, would flock together to back an initiative that would help society overcome authoritarianism. And there was a deafening silence. Mm -hmm. And this is terrible because the ex-members are the people who have the understanding to share. And it's getting past the idea that they were involved in a 
therapy group, a commercial group, a religious group, a political group, or whatever, and saying, I understand the experience from the inside. And it's not talking about cults. It is talking about authoritarian relationships and how one becomes willing to be abused. You know, yeah, I, I I'm mean, sharing that. It, it's always stunning to me that this is such a, a, a you know, a pervasive reality, uh, authoritarianism within our society. And it affects and lands on in, in so many families' lives. Yet the resources, yeah, you know, they 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 don't recognize it as such. No, and 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 that leaves the individuals who are trying to share the, the their knowledge, uh, kind of standing as as a lone man on the shouting on the mountaintop. You know, the fool on the hill, as Paul. McCartney that's right. Said. Yeah, that's very much so. Okay, I'm. This has been great, and yep. um, let's switch off the recorders. Uh, I'm John okay, Aitken. Yep. This is Joe Kelly, and uh, we'll switch off now. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.